Hey fellow detective, welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to be discussing one of the most heinous cases of juvenile delinquency in post-war Japan. Junko Furuta, a high school student, was adopted, raped, tortured, and ultimately murdered by four male teenagers. The abuse lasted for a period of 40 days from November 25, 1988, to the next year, January 4, and culminated in Junko's body being discovered and cased in a concrete drum. This horrific crime has been referred to as the concrete encased high school girl murder case. Let's look into the case, but before that, please subscribe to the channel if you want to see more true crime stories. Junko Furuta was a bright-eyed 70-years-old high school girl with a world of possibilities ahead of her. She dreamed of a bright future filled with adventure and excitement. But her life took a tragic turn that is beyond comprehension. Our story begins in 1988, in the heart of Sentama Prefecture, Japan. Junko was a student in Sentama Yoshio Minami High School, leading a fairly typical life for a young woman of her age. She worked part-time to save up for life after graduation, maintained excellent grades, and stayed out of trouble. Her peers adore her for her kind nature, but her refusal to drink, smoke, or do drugs gave her a reputation for being naive and a good girl among the rodeo crowd. However, Junko's reputation didn't deter the attention of one particular individual, Hiroshi Miyano. Hiroshi was an 80 years old classmate of Junko's who had earned himself a reputation as the school's bully. But his notoriety extended far beyond the school gates, as he was also a lower level Yasuka Gensta. Unaware of this, when Hiroshi asked Junko to be his girlfriend, she politely declined. Little did Junko know, her rejection would be the beginning of the end for her. What followed was a nightmare that would last for 40 days. To give you more context here, the term Yakuza was originally used to describe gangster in Japan, but it now refers to organized crime syndicates that operate in various illegal activities like prostitution, gambling, and even politics. The origin of this syndicate is somewhat unclear, with various claims that they descend from honorable samurai who turned to crime during times of peace and prosperity in Japan. During World War II, the Yakuza gained a foothold in society as nationalism rose, which gave them access to political figures. Their influence even extended to the assassination of political opponents. Despite their criminal nature, the Yakuza adhere to strict rules of etiquette, including a code that prohibit harming innocent people. Punishments for violating this rule can include cutting off a portion of one's pinky finger. This practice has even led to the term yubikiri, meaning pinky promise. Let me take you back to November 25th, a day that would forever change the life of one innocent young woman. Hiroshi and his accomplice, Nobuharu Minato, were seasoned criminal on the prowl in Misato. Their intentions were sinister, to rob and rape unsuspecting women. And on that fateful day, they spotted their prey, Junko, a high school student biking home from her part-time job. Without a second thought, Nobuharu kicked Junko to the ground as she rode past. It was a brutal and senseless act of violence, but little did Junko know, her ordeal was far from over. As fate would have it, Harashi was lurking in the shadows and witnessed the attack. Seizing the opportunity, he swooped in and offered to walk Junko home, pretending to be her protector. Junko, grateful for the help, accepted his offer without suspecting anything. Harashi was leading her straight into a trap, a dark and desolate warehouse where he would rape her repeatedly. After Hawashi Miyano raped Junko, he couldn't resist the urge to brag about his second action to his friend, Nobuharu, Jo Ogura, and Yasushi Watanabe were soon brought in on the crime to help hide Junko away from the world. 
But there's the thing, Jungkook wasn't the first victim of this twist game. They had previously gang raped an other woman who was eventually released. However, Jungkook's situation was different. She had rejected Hiroshi's offense, which provoked him to retaliate in the most unimaginable way. To keep her captive for their continuous exploitation, the gang took Jungkook to a vacant house owned by Nobuharu's family in Adanchi, Tokyo. Fear was their weapon of choice, threatening Jungko that the Yakuza would kill her family if she didn't comply. After two days, Jungko's family reported her missing, and again knew they had to act fast. They forced Jungko to call home and say that she had run away and was staying with friends to deter any further police investigation. But. Little did Jungko family know that this would be the last time they would ever hear their daughter's voice. The call served as a smoke screen that hindered any possibility of a rescue. The truth was that Jungko was trapped in a living nightmare that was about to take a turn for the worse. When a boy kidnapped Jungko, they showed her true colors in the most gruesome way. They locked her away and subjected her to horrific abuse and violence. They took turns assaulting her foul body, sometimes even multiple times in a single day. But the worst day of all was when twelve men came to satisfy their depravity, leaving Jungko battered and broken. Over the course of her captivity, she endured the agonizing abuse of about a hundred men, more than four hundred times. In just twenty short days, Jungko's life became a living nightmare. The gang of boys who had taken her captive subjected her to brutal and unrelenting beatings with various burdens, leaving her body battered and broken. And as if that wasn't enough, they mutilate her flesh, leaving her unable to walk. In the frigid winter months, they showed no mercy, leaving her to sleep outside on a balcony or locked in the freezer for hours on end. To add insult to injury, the boys strip her naked and force her to remain that way, using her body as a tool for their own sick amusement. They would make her dance for them, or worse yet, force her to masturbate in front of them. The kidnapper also beat Jungko with golf clubs and bashed her face into the concrete floor. They didn't even give her food or water, but instead forced her to drink her own urine and eat cockroach. They hanged her from the ceiling and used her as a punching bag. The men even burned her eyelids with lighters and hot wax and ripped off her nipples with a pair of pillars. Despite the severity of her injuries, the kidnappers never once considered taking Jungko to a hospital. Her injuries were so severe that she lost control of her bowel and repeatedly vomited. But instead of showing her any mercy or compassion, the kidnappers only became more infuriated and beat her even more to punish her. Despite her unimaginable suffering, Jungko never gave up hope. At one point, she managed to get her hands on a phone and dialed for emergency service, but the boys caught her before she could speak and punished her mercilessly, pulling lighters fluid on her legs and igniting it. When the police called back, Hiroshi pretended it had been an accident, assuaging their concerns. By the latter half of her captivity, she was completely broken beyond repair. Blood filled her nasal cavity, making it impossible for her to breathe through her nose. Her stomach was so damaged that she couldn't even keep water down, immediately vomiting it up. Even crawling from one room to another took her hours, and eventually she was confined to Nobuharu's room. The endless assault had even caused her brain to shrink in size. On her final day, the game had all but lost interest in Jungko. Her once beautiful face was now so swollen that her features were hardly recognizable, and a foul rotting snatch emanated from her body. Later that day, after losing a game of mahjong, Hiroshi enacted his final act of brutality. Over the course of two hours, he and his friend beat Jungko mercilessly. 
They continued to beat her incapacitated body before dosing her entire body with an accelerant and let the fire finish her off. In a panic, the four men realized the gravity of their actions and knew they had to dispose of the body. They decided to stuff Junko's lifeless body into a travel bag, then throw it into a metal drum they had stolen from a construction site, sealed it with cement, and loaded it onto a borrowed truck from Hamashi's workplace. They went their separate ways to obtain the necessary materials, including cement, discarded oil drums, and even bricks stolen from construction sites. With the evidence of the heinous crime now hidden away, they drove to a desolate area in Tokyo's Kyoto Ward, where they planned to dump the oil drum containing Junko's body. The area was known for its industrial ways, and the men hoped that Junko's body would blend in with other waste oil drums and be dispersed in in batches by a company looking to get rid of them. However, Harashi and his group of young men were just half-hearted gangsters who didn't know that Yakuza had long stopped using cement to dispose of bodies. Body suit in cement would continue to swell, but a covering of cement and mantle drums would prevent the gases from being released, causing the body eventually burst through the cement and metal. After 41 days of captivity, Junko finally broke through the cement and metal drums and saw the blue sky again. Junko had finally escaped, but her revenge was not as smooth as she had hoped. All four boys confessed their guilt, but sought leniency by pleading to a lesser charge akin to third-degree murder, their defense. While they acknowledged their fallen treatment of Junko, they contended her death was unintended and accidental. During the trial, the identities of the boys were initially shielded from the public eye due to their juvenile status at the time of the crime. Despite this, they were tried as adults. Legal boundaries, however, did not deter the press. Journalists went ahead and exposed their names in a magazine article. When it came to sentencing, Harashi bore the bronze of the punishment among the four. He was sentenced to a staggering 70 years in prison, later increased to 20, while his accomplice received sentence ranging from 3 to 9 years. The leniency of their sentence sparked controversy, seen as grossly inadequate in light of the heinousness of their crimes. The Japanese prison system, which is primarily focused on rehabilitating rather than punishing, especially young offenders, was brought into the spotlight. By the time they reached their mid-thirties, all of Junko's killers had been released from prison, with some opting to change their names. Harashi returned to his old ways, re-engaging with Yakuza activities and was subsequently arrested in 2013 for fraud. Lastly, one of the accomplices, Nobuharu, was rebranded himself as Shihinji Minato, was put on trial for attempted murder in 2019.